the book is over there, so I don't have a copy now here. But uh, yeah, so this is my second book, uh, entitled My French Family Table. And often when I'm asked what's the difference between the first one and the second one is, um, the first one was focusing more on introducing recipes that I know to do across, and it was actually divided uh, by occasions. Whereas this one, uh, four years later, uh, focuses more on family, uh, and untitled French family table, meaning that the food is obviously French by essence. Uh, and uh, specifically um, for the book and for the general um, understanding of fr French cuisine, I wanted specifically to uh, try to educate people to uh, uh, understanding that uh, French cuisine is not necessarily all only uh, meaning fine dining and elegant. Uh, as a matter of fact, French people eat very simple things every day. And this book is a translation of the kind of workflow, um, so to speak, of how um, a typical French family would eat, which obviously sounds very cliche, but it is our reality every day. Um, uh, in 2002, I had one daughter. In 2016, we have two children. Um, so it even made more sense to uh, write this book because uh, for me, educating my children to uh, taste and good food is uh, a strong part of their education. So I really wanted this book to focus on that. So um, when you look at the book, uh, you will see that the book uh, follows the rhythm of our day from breakfast recipes to um, a lunch. Um, and my typical lunch would be a savory tart, salad, soups, that's typically uh, what we enjoy eating. There's a section focusing on cooking with my daughter specifically, because obviously Remy uh, it's too small for that yet. Uh, but I want to share um, the passion I have to including her in uh, cooking food. Uh, so there's a whole section devoted to that. Uh, there's a section talking about um, the typical snack that French people do, um, which typically happens at 4 p.m. every day after school. Um, there's a section on um, main courses and obviously on desserts because I love to make desserts. Uh, one thing that um, is worth noting, but is not necessarily the main focus of my book, but I uh, want to mention it more so for the second and the first, uh, it turns out that all the recipes in the book are gluten-free. And the reason why I don't want this to be the focus, because for me, the focus has to be on enjoyment of food and not on saying this is a special diet. As a matter of fact, when people come to the house, I never emphasize that the book is gluten-free or the recipes are, are gluten-free. Um, it's all about sharing a moment together around the table. Uh, so that's something that now, especially, I've been eating gluten-free for more than 10 years. And 10 years ago, uh, things were very different from what they are today. Um, and I know that now there's way more um, emphasis and uh, having a gluten-free diet is more, um, I don't want to say it's the norm, but it's more like, oh yeah, right. It's, it's more available and accessible. So um, that's something that now we actually added on the sub subtitle of the book as well. Uh, the first one didn't have that uh, byline. So for today, I chose a recipe that um, is very um, uh, flexible in the sense of um, it is a chocolate cake that I um, have included in the chocolate section of the book because at home we eat a lot of chocolate. We love chocolate every season. There's no season for chocolate. So here we are July and uh, every day there's a chocolate cake at the house. Uh, the reason why this cake is very interesting is because it's got three components. It's got the chocolate base cake, uh, a decoration made of mascarpone cheese and very simple with a bit of sugar and white whipped cream and decorated with fresh raspberries. And the reason why this recipe is very uh, welcomed in any kitchen, I find, is uh, uh, I use the chocolate cake base as an everyday cake. As a matter of fact, I make this chocolate cake every week at the house, something that I like to nibble on throughout the day. Uh, and I'm not kidding, I do that. <laughs> And, uh, and then when you have friends coming over um, for a meal, it's nice to actually have something more decorated. Um, so I use the other two pieces, which is the mascarpone cheese element and the raspberries to dress it up. Um, the recipes in the book are actually designed this way. I like to take an everyday recipe, and if I need to transform it into something more dressed up, I can with little touch-ups to finish the dish. 
so I'm not going to give example now, but uh, if you looked uh, throughout the book, some main courses are designed this way, where you would have something that the whole family enjoys, children included, because there's nothing that separates children from adult food. Uh, but some touches that are, would be more complicated for children can be added, so you don't have to think about two different menus when you have people coming over. That's like, nobody likes that. I mean, at home, I, I, I try not to do that whenever possible. So the cake, this is a chocolate cake uh, made with buckwheat and hazelnut. So it is gluten-free, as I said. It uses um, chocolate here. It uses butter and uh, eggs, hazelnut meal, buckwheat, and what else? Uh, a little bit of fleur de sel. Uh, for the chocolate base and that's pretty much it and then for the decoration i have mascarpone um, whipped cream and raspberries and fini finishing touches with conf confectioned sugar so i'm going to start with um, my chocolate and um, my sugar but at home um, i usually put everything uh, by weight something that is specified in the book is always um, measure and weight every ingredients you have for accuracy. So you need roughly, I have the recipe here, but like um, about 100, I, I put here um, 125 grams. Okay, 125, a little more. Okay, then the sugar. Um, I have here um, 70 grams, depending also, um, I, at home, not to be biased, but I do use a lot of the Valrhona chocolate, and I like to use, uh, look at the co uh, um, cocoa contents of the chocolate. So my favorites are between 66 to 70% cocoa contents. Um, if you use 66, you might actually want a little less sugar. If you use 70%, you want to have a little more sugar. I played by, you know, whatever chocolate is handy, but roughly you want seven, between 70 and 80 grams of sugar, 80 grams of butter. Okay, so you melt that. So then three eggs. Put the eggs, and that's where the sugar goes. Okay, so here, I don't know what's the content of that chocolate, but I'll put roughly 80 grams. So you put that in here. You want a texture that's going to be um, creamy and light in color, so you can leave that unattended and then let it do its things while you prepare that and measure the rest of the ingredients. So I'm done with this. Uh, and I'm now going to measure the buckwheat flour, the hazelnut and the fleur de sel. What's nice about fleur de sel, it just adds a little bit of specks of salt to the final um, taste of the ch um, chocolate base. So I need about 40 grams of each flour. That's the buckwheat. I like to use buckwheat with chocolate specifically, recipes, and then hazelnut. And this is hazelnut, you could use almond, you could use, uh, if people are allergic to nuts, you could use quinoa, millet, and if you have nothing about, um, or it's not important to eat gluten-free, you can use even um, regular flour. The buckwheat is actually nice for taste uh, factor but you could use all-purpose flour as well instead of the nuts. But the nuts actually add a very good um, texture to the cake. A uh, little fleur de sel here. And that I keep that for later. So now I just have to watch how everything is doing. Just waiting for the chocolate to melt with the butter. I'm curious about the uh, gluten thing. Yes. Uh, when I lived in France, uh, and flour was everywhere. Uh, real flour, uh, wheat, wheat flour, yeah. bread, pastry, and so on. Has the gluten-free fad hit France? It's starting. It's not going to be as prevailing in places like uh, the U.S. or even Ireland. My my parents-in-law are Irish, and uh, there's a lot of people that are actually. I'm not celiac, but there's a lot of people that are actually celiac in um, in Ireland. So it's very easy to get um, everything gluten-free, including bread, in restaurants. In France, you would not find that. So it is still a challenge for me, but um, you know you get used to um, doing without it. It's hard to imagine eating in France without bread. But you can make, I mean, I make my own bread. So I mean, yes, I don't eat the baguette the same way and there are things that I don't, you know, cook the same way. Um, but there's a lot of food that are gluten-free in essence. 
So when you go to restaurants, definitely people are educated to it. They would always accommodate, but they would not have replacements for like, let's say there's restaurants in the Boston area where they actually even serve gluten-free bread, good restaurants. But in France, that would be a little, I think, um, you know, too much to ask. Okay. So, move a few things. I'm gonna turn that down. So this is nice lights in color. Okay, so I'm gonna put that in here. So this is what I have now here. And then I'm going just to basically use this spatula to um, just mix it in together. So do you just leave it out during the week? Yeah. It doesn't last very long. <laughs> but at some point, then you need to put it in the fridge? Or? Yeah. I mean, if it's hot weather like that, I would definitely, you know. In winter, I wouldn't need to, but when it's hot and it's pretty muggy like this, mm -hmm. I would uh, put it in the fridge. But then I would actually take it out of the fridge. To ro it's nicer eaten at room temperature because obviously the fridge is going to make it feel like harder. It's not actually unpleasant by any means, but it just alters the, the, the texture, definitely. It makes it harder. More like almost, almost like a kind of a... Like a it, it loses its moistness, uh, the moisture of it. Um, as a matter of fact, I made one, I don't know what day is today, Tuesday, I made one, forget when, Sunday maybe, yes, when it was very hot, Sunday, when it was a little less hot, Sunday, and I put it in the fridge last night, and I had a slice earlier this morning at 11 a.m., it's a cup of tea. Normally you would put parchment paper um, for easiness of... Um, you know, removing the cake or cutting it nice better. But um, you can actually, if you especially have a nice pan at home, you could actually, uh, a ceramic pan, you could actually bake it just, you just butter it generously and then you just put um, the butter in it. Okay. And so you, you notice there's no um, um, yeast or anything or like a baking powder in it. So it is not a cake that's gonna be very high, uh, rise very much. And then you preheat your oven at uh, 350 and then you put that in the oven for 25 to 30 minutes, that's it. And depending, uh, the one I, uh, that I make at home, my pan is a little different, so actually it's a little higher. I actually use a, um, a rectangular pan. Um, and then you just basically eat it like that, or then you're gonna end up slicing it for tasting. So you're going to um, cut it in small squares. And I'll just do like this to demonstrate. When I serve it as a uh, dessert uh, for guests, I like to actually cut slices like this. And you can see that actually in the picture in the book. And so that's a bigger size. And basically, I would pipe the mascarpone. Uh, I would use a tip that actually has a little decoration. And you would pipe, let's say, six pieces here with six um, raspberries on top. So I can demonstrate uh, with that as well. The next step is uh, using um, mascarpone and um, whipped cream. So I have both here prepared for me. This uh, mascarpone is lightly sweetened with uh, confectioner sugar. Uh, the whipped cream here has this nice um, firmer texture and you basically combine both together uh, so that the mascarpone is not too dense and the whipped cream makes it a little lighter. And then um, you get this, which is always better if it's um, a little, um, you know, like on days like, like today, you know, if I was to leave uh, this out, it would become a little too soft. So I try to make, to keep it in the fridge as long as possible so that it doesn't uh, soften, especially with the whipped cream. And then you just pipe in a little bit.
and I'm gonna do, and then I have my raspberries. The last piece would be to use um, confectioner sugar. What I would do at home also is add a little bit of um, cocoa powder. Or you know what you could do also? It's like, which I always have a box of that at home. Like um, if you're familiar with cocoa nibs, cocoa nibs are beautiful in a lot of different ways on finishes like this or even with granola or any kind of yogurty um, dessert. Um, but anyway. Confectioner sugar always makes things nicer, I find. It's a cloud of happiness. See? Gives it life. And then after that, you would put this, you would do exactly the same with a bit of cocoa powder. Like this. And then you could put, um, well, imagine I have cocoa nibs. I would put cocoa nibs. I could put some chopped hazelnuts and my little cloud of, um, <laughs> my cloud of cocoa powder. Voila, that's my recipe. Thank you. Any questions? So my question is that uh, uh, every time people ask me about you know, food from my culture or my country, I can tell them exactly what I like to cook myself, what my parents cook for me, what my two sets of grandparents, and maybe restaurants at home, and that's pretty much it. So how do you do your research, or do you do any research so that you can have like a French cuisine or French cookbook, or do you just like well, present your own ideas? Well, no, well, food has always been with me for many, many years, and so um, from being a little girl, I grew up in a very small village in France with a very strong homegrown uh, cooking, so everyone had vegetable gardens, and, and food was really a pre prevailing conversation at home. So my memories of cooking have been following me through the years, and so when I was a little girl, I kept those little kitchen, uh, actually little notebooks where I would uh, cut um, recipes from uh, magazines and stick them in them. So it's not something that just happened recently when all of a sudden I decided to write a book. Um, and uh, but, but having said that, so it's, it's something that's been with me for a long time and um, I, I, I pretty much, I'm pretty obsessed with food. Let's put it this way. But um, there's so many ways to keep up with what's happening in your own home country, including magazines where, I mean, I have two that I'm subscribed to. Uh, being a blogger myself, I know what's happening. Uh, so I'm reading what's going on um, in France about, on the food scene, uh, what people like to eat, what the food trends are. Um, but it really depends on the kind of um, memories attached to your own uh, Food. Oh, where are you from? Hungary. Hungary. And so, you know, there's, I, st I still think there's a lot of uh, things um, that you can explain and, and then go back to, you know, you have your childhood memories and then you have, um, I mean, magazines. Are there Hungarian food magazines? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, they definitely talk more about what Hungarians eat. And it's the same, you know, like as a matter of fact, I got a package from my mother yesterday, including one of my subscribed magazine. And I can see, oh yeah, right, you know, summer comes, here comes the vegetable tart, here comes the barbecue things that are typical of France, you know. The whip, I mean, as an example, French people would have a barbecue, Americans would have a barbecue, but they would eat completely different things. So it's just something that is inside, I think, um, yeah, uh, educating people to taste and, and, and what, um, even the way people present food is different. Um, but I think um, it's not difficult for me to, to keep with this here because, uh, I mean, the accessibility to ingredients is very uh, easy. Uh, there's nothing that I feel short of, like including, yeah, I mean, in Boston, you, I find pretty much everything uh, if I want to e eat or cook authentic uh, French food. But my cuisine, and, and I like to say that, my, my food is not like, if you're expecting to eat or find in the book things like uh, Blanquette de Veau or Boeuf Bourguignon or those kind of very um, traditional food recipes, uh, that's not so much what I, I like to cook. I, I like to 
focus more on traditional recipes, but with my own touches and, and, and the, the modern way, so to speak. So it's obviously catering to the family needs. Uh, recipes are faster, they are easier to make. Uh, it's not gonna be a bœuf bourguignon that takes four hours to cook. That's not the kind of uh, cuisine I offer in the book. Um, it's more, um, yeah, catering to uh, every day uh, at home. So it's really what we eat. Does that answer your question? Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Do you find that moving to the U.S. you had to alter the way that you cook this stuff just because of, like, I don't know, just like the ovens are different or the pans are different? Well, I know people a lot uh, talk about s s some ingredients like flour, butter is different. And I have actually, I, I, um, I am friends with people at the uh, Vermont Butter and Cheese Company. And my friend Adeline, uh, who is actually in charge of um, uh, a big production part of, the, of making cheese and cream and everything, always tells me butter is a big deal and, and, and it's never going to be the same. Um, but you, I find adjusting very uh, easy, actually. Um, there, there will be, if I was really like scientific about food, more so, especially with baking, uh, you know, making a baguette or all those kind of things, Possibly, I would find flowers more challenging. But obviously, on my end, because I also uh, use other flowers and wheat-based ones, um, I don't find any difference or like challenge. Um, as a matter of fact, I find one thing that I really loved moving here was um, in France. As an example, farmers market are very beautiful, you know, in season, uh, especially in the south when you you travel there in the summer. But uh, People often say, oh, there's farmer's market throughout the year in France. But actually, if you go to Paris and you go to those uh, marché, you know, like outside, and, and you actually look at the labels where things come from, a lot of them in the middle of winter are not coming from France. They come from Morocco, they come from Spain or the Netherlands, wherever. Whereas when I came here, I remember going to the farmer's market and thinking, Jesus, like 10 stands, that's like ridiculous. And I started really understanding the whole concept of the farmer's market and why it's so nice to have farmer's market here because what you find is what people produce and it's no like things coming from Spain or like anywhere else. It's basically what people make. And I, tend, I ended up like preferring those kind of markets to the one that uh, even I'm, I'm from the northeastern part of France where it's not like the south, you can grow things as, as uh, much with abundance and uh, you go to the market and you really find things that are coming from North America, I mean, sorry, uh, North Africa. You know, bananas, uh, you find everything at the market. Well, nobody in France grows bananas, right? So, well, whereas here you go to the farmer's market, you just find what people produce. And I think that's much better. That's, 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 that makes more sense. Um. Yes? So, when you're cooking for your family, how long does it take? And then how long do you spend when people come in? What's the difference? So how long it takes to make and then, sorry, the last part? Yeah, so how long when you're cooking just for your family versus how long you're cooking when you're entertaining guests? Um, well, uh, it depends what I obviously make, but uh, I would say on average I would spend, let's say an hour in the kitchen, you know. Uh, Obviously, when Remy arrived, uh, there was more chaos at home with two children. And uh, um, but um, as I said, I don't separate. So I make one main course. And that doesn't mean that our daughter specifically, we like everything. But we have a rule. She, try, she needs to try everything, sometimes reluctantly. But that's OK. You know, that's not, uh, we don't win at every battle. Um, but. Um, there's always going to be something she likes, uh, and then the rest is pretty much a main course that we can, uh, how do you say, um, like for, as an example, I would make a risotto, which you know from start to finish is roughly 30 minutes. You know, you cook it for 20 minutes, you have maybe 10 minutes prep, um, and then with that I would make a salad, and then maybe I would have smoked salmon, or I would have, I don't know, like a piece of fish, like easy, like a, a baked fish you would have, um, like a piece of nice uh, wild uh, salmon, um, you oil with salt, pepper, fresh herbs, 
15 minutes in the oven, you don't have to think about it, and then a green salad, and you have dinner. So when guests come, obviously, you know, I can, I, it can go from like very quick like this to I have to be in the kitchen all day. <laughs> and I do that. I like when my husband asks me, oh, yeah, let's go hiking this morning and do this, or let's go do the shopping in the morning. I'm thinking, you're out of your mind, you know? <laughs> I have people coming tonight. I'm not going shopping in the morning. I'm not doing all those things in the morning. You know, I have to focus on the food and, and you know, I organize my day around that. I prep like, let's say, an, like a cold soup that has to sit in the fridge and, uh, and then I can finish the main course in the evening. And the dessert typically, if it's a, something like this, the, the base would be um, baked in the morning and I can assemble in the evening. But, um, I love what I do, so obviously uh, cooking is something that I don't, I'm not shy to spending time doing. But for um, the recipes in the book are de definitely um, offering a variety of lengths and times. Um, and and it's, it's really, what I love about the books, even more so this one than the first one, is it's a very lived in book. It's like we live with it every day. I, I, as a matter of fact, which is very rare for me to go back to my own recipes, but I take my own book from the shelf and I cook from it. And it's like, yeah, first one, I can retest, hey, yeah, they work. You know, that's a big deal. And second, this is really the food or the recipes we eat. And whether it's for us or for when people come. And I, I really like that about it. It's really a used book. It's not just, because, you know, like every person who does what I do, I own a lot of books at home. And do I cook from them? Probably not for most of them. I, I mean, I'm a photographer, so I like to take, time looking and getting inspired by what other people do, how they do it. Um, but it's nice to have a book um, that I can go back to and, um, and use every day. Do you, you know, for your blogging and like working on social media, do you keep like a schedule for yourself on like what days you do that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's what I would want to. Okay, I was able to do that probably two, three years ago. The last few years, uh, the last year and a half have been more challenging. So I'm, I'm slowly getting back into trying steps by step to first to go back to blogging. And, and you know, things have changed so much also. When I started, all there was was blogs. And you know, I, I'm I think one of the first food bloggers. I'm not the first exactly, but amongst the first food blogs that exist. Now there's uh, so many more blogs. Even for me, it's very hard to keep up with everything that's out there. And things have changed. So myself, I migrated to become a avid blogger to a more avid Instagrammer. And because what I do is very visual, Instagram is very uh, gratifying because I can do snap and my picture tells a story of what's happening in my life right now. So my f uh, readership, I think, migrated from many people following my blog, and they still exist, but um, to people that now follow me a lot on Instagram. I think on Instagram, which happened for different reasons, you know, I don't know the tools of how people sometimes get, like, so many followers, but sometimes uh, along the way, and I know I've been featured a few times on Instagram, so that always helps. <laughs> obviously, but I have something like 60,000 uh, followers and which started from zero to 60 and I think people migrate themselves, you know, from Facebook to Twitter and, um, and blogs still, but it, it takes more, and, and you know, it takes more time with the blog, depending on what kind of uh, content you deliver. I, I tend to want a nice story with a nice picture, you know, so to produce that for me, takes more time so I don't have right now a very tight schedule on that I am hopeful to go back to something better but um, my reality right now is I don't have the time because you know I do this I have the book but I have my own clients you know people I do a lot of editorial work I do I do commercial work and uh, this is how I, ha I have a living the blog is very nice but the blog is supporting my work but it's not I'm not generating a lot of revenue with the blog so, thank you. So now I think you can sample food and I can sign books. <laughs>